Yep, I can. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, well, this evening, it's good to be with you once again. And uh, if you have your Bibles there, I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians. And I'd like to read uh, chapter 1 and verses 1 through 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. So it begins this way. Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called, unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And again, God always blesses the reading of his word, and I know will this evening. Last week, we looked a little bit at the beginning of this assembly, the commencement of the work, and how Paul went into this wicked city of Corinth, and in weakness and fear and trembling, and yet in dependence on the Spirit of God, in dependence of God in prayer, uh, and confident in the power of the gospel, he preached. And there was a great work done, and many came to the Savior from the synagogue and from uh, the the general pagan society. And so the, the, we saw a little bit of the composition of the assembly, uh, both the mixture of Jews and Gentiles in one body, just an amazing work had been done. And this evening, I want to look at the correspondence now. Uh, we've thought of its commencement. We've thought of its composition. We want to think of the correspondence that took place to this assembly. And Paul, as he went into the city around about AD 51 and did this amazing work, he was there for 18 months. And then uh, he left and went on to new places to evangelize and preach the gospel. And eventually, word got to him of what was going on in Corinth after his departure. And so he writes this letter, many think somewhere around 55 or 56 uh, AD. Uh, when he writes to the church there in Corinth. And what was the reason? What, what news had come to Paul about the assembly? What did, what had he heard? Well, there's two aspects that we want to bring before our minds this evening. There was kind of a twofold reason for him writing to them. The first one dealt with matters that had been raised uh, by a particular family in the assembly, the household of Chloe. We see that in verse 11, where it says, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So matters uh, had been brought to his attention uh, from the house of Chloe. And these matters were particularly concerning factions in the assembly, that there was among them. There were divisions, there were rivalries, and so it was concerning factions. And then, as well as from the house of Chloe, word had got to him as well about some gross immorality in the assembly. And if you look at chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And so this was not just the house of Chloe, but obviously he'd heard from many sources. It's, it's commonly uh, known that this is going on. Uh, it's reported commonly there's fornication. And so uh, factions and fornication, two of the issues that have raised their ugly head in the assembly in Corinth. Now, of course, we might ask ourselves a question about the house of Chloe. Um, was this gossip? And what's what, what makes something gossip and what makes something legitimate? 
Well, I think what makes something legitimate is the fact that they were willing to have their name named in connection with the issue. And that is not gossip. In other words, when you're saying, look, there's a real problem in this assembly. And oh, by the way, don't don't tell anybody that I told you. Right. That's that's gossip. That's I'm not willing to, as it were, put my name to it. Uh, but the House of Chloe are, are named forever on the pages of Holy Writ that they told Paul about the problems out of concern. Uh, of what was going on in the assembly. And it certainly wasn't gossip. It was genuine concern for the assembly, for the factions that were taking place, and then the others concerning the fornication. And of course, Paul had to deal with these things. And of course, these divisions were connected with powerful personalities. And of course, the personalities we're going to see as we move on are people like Paul himself. Some kind of ran after him. Others went after to. Others went after Apollos, and then there were really spiritual ones said, oh, we're, we're just following Christ. But they were all divided into these various groups in the assembly. And then, of course, uh, there's this matter of this incestual fornication that was taking place, and it was allowed to go undisciplined and undealt with in the assembly. And it's always a tragedy when things are not taken care of in the assembly, especially discipline. And therefore, Paul has to deal with this breach of God's holiness in the assembly. Holiness belongeth to thy house, O God. And there was a breakdown in basic holiness that had to be dealt with. And the problem is that if we don't deal with these things, if we just put them under the carpet, so to speak, what happens is that it gives others uh, kind of courage to also act in wicked ways, because they think to themselves, they reason this way, if this guy got away with it, then surely I can too. And so there's an important need to discipline uh, those that are involved in immorality or matters that require discipline, not just immorality. So there's this, these matters raised. And so we basically, in the first uh, four chapters, he deals with the issue of factions in the assembly. And then in five and six, he deals with the issue of sexual immorality that needs taking care of in the assembly as well. And then on top of hearing these reports, there was also some correspondence that had come to Paul from the Corinthians themselves asking questions. And so we see in chapter seven, uh, he begins to deal with this. Chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And so he, he begins to deal with the questions they had written. And so in chapter 7, the questions that they're asking is concerning marriage and divorce. And so he, he takes up those issues of marriage and divorce, a very important issue. In chapter 7, in verse 25, uh, he's going to take up another matter. Verse 25 says, now concerning virgins. And so it's the matter of virginity, and he wants to deal with that, the idea of purity, virginity, staying chaste. And so he's going to deal with that issue. Uh, chapter 8, it says, now is touching things offered unto idols. And so it was concerning the buying and eating of meat that had once been offered to an idol because idols have very little appetite. And therefore, that meat, once it had been offered, was still good meat. And so you could get it at a reduced rate because it had been presented before an idol. And so some of the Christians had liberty to do that and others were just horrified at it. And so he deals with this whole issue of Christian liberty and, and the matter of things uh, that had been sacrificed to idols. Then when we get to chapter 12, it's now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. I would have not you to be ignorant. So it's to do with, well, spiritual gifts, but it's bigger than that. It's really spirituality, but certainly the use of gifts is a big issue that he deals with in chapter 12. And then chapter 16, again, something they clearly written and asked about. Uh, he says in chapter 16 and verse 1, he says, now concerning the collection for the saints. And so he wants to deal with that matter. And then one more thing in verse 12 of chapter 16, and as touching our brother Apollos, maybe some had asked questions about Apollos. And so he wants to deal with that as well. And so it's 
all things that had been basically brought to his attention by questions that had come to him in a letter a doctrinal issue that needs to be dealt with as well and perhaps the most important issue in the whole epistle in chapter 15 and that is that some were in teaching error concerning the resurrection of christ in fact some were actually denying the resurrection of christ and denying bodily resurrection so that was a a, a very important issue that had to be dealt with and was being dealt with in chapter 15. So <clears throat> it's interesting how Paul deals with it. He, he deals with the things that had been told to him first, and then he deals with their questions secondly. And it would seem that the things that they'd asked him, they obviously were not concerned about the things that had been brought to his attention from Chloe, or else they would have written them in their questions. Uh, what about factions? What about sexual immorality? Uh, they didn't seem to think that they were issues that needed to be dealt with. But Paul obviously sensed the urgency of dealing with those things, and he deals with them first before he gets to answering those questions. But one of the things about 1 Corinthians, as we well know, and I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but this is good review for all of us, but Corinthians is corrective in nature, and it's so valuable to us. In fact, in many ways, we should be thankful that the early churches were full of problems, because if they hadn't have been full of problems, these letters might not have been written, and we would not have had case law to know how to deal with our problems. And so really it's, it's a blessing in disguise that there were all these issues in the early church and that Paul took the time to write to them. And so now when we face problems, and of course we're living in Corinthian-like societies ourselves and many of the issues in this letter are that we might face in the average assembly in an average city on this continent. And so what a blessing it is to have actual case law and say, well, how did, how did they deal with that in Corinth? Because obviously, however they dealt with that, that's how we should deal with it. And we can go and see how Paul addressed these issues. And we have that wonderful benefit of case law to be able to deal with problems ourselves. So that's a little bit about the, the background, which is very, very significant in this epistle and important to understand. We, we need to uh, grasp uh, what was behind the letter. And one of the things that we also need to observe, and I think it's very significant, is that Paul wants to emphasize greatly in this letter that what was going on in Corinth was out of harmony with many other assemblies. And he wants to kind of bring them in line, uh, that there's a universal practice in the New Testament church, and Paul wants to make sure that they get in line. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see examples of that uh, throughout the text where he talks about teaching the same things in every church. And so we don't want to miss that. Let me give you an example. Chapter 4 and verse 17, for example, where he says to them, uh, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring to your into your remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Chapter 7 and verse 17. Again, we get the same idea, but God, as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. And so again, he's appealing to a universal practice that he uh, uh, ordains in, uh, look at 11, chapter 11, verse 16, concerning the veiling of women and all the things connected with that. He says in verse 16, he says, but if any man seem to be contentious, we, that's the apostolic we, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words, what's going on at Corinth is out of sync with all the churches of God. And what he's saying to them is, get in line. Uh, you're acting independently of what is taught universally in all the churches. Chapter 14. Again, we get that same idea in verse 33. 
He says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And he says this, as in all the churches of the saints, let your women keep silence in the churches. It's not permitted them, unto them to speak, but they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in church. So again, as in all the churches of the saints. So it's just good to recognize that as Paul went around evangelizing and then establishing local testimonies in these various places, that there was a universal pattern that had been established. And when an assembly began to veer from that pattern, he would correct them and remind them they were out of step. They were marching to a different tune and they needed to get in line and, and follow the practice, the apostolic practice that was in all the churches. So when we look now at our passage in chapter one, we want to begin by verses one through three. We get his greeting and we get a glimpse at his audience as he gives this greeting. And then his thanksgiving for all the problems in the assembly in Corinth. And there were many. There was still much to thank. Work of grace had been done in that city. And so verses four through nine is thanksgiving. And then from chapter uh, one verse 10 uh, he deals with the problems of division and he, he he has an appeal and he has an argument that he brings in in dealing with these things but that's not our remit this evening we want to just think about the greeting and the thanksgiving now before we're too hard on the corinthian assembly and i find myself sometimes that uh, i i can be that way and yet i need to keep reminding myself that this assembly had been going at max five years, four or five years, and that those that were in it were all first-generation believers, newly saved, I mean, out of the world, and they've only been going four or five years, and they're living in a wicked environment, and that environment is having an effect upon them. And so, again, just good to be reminded of that, that this, this is a work of all new converts, and, and, and they don't have older senior saints to look to, uh, because uh, the ones that were senior saints were the missionaries that came there, and they've moved on. And so uh, the only perhaps advantage that any of them might have had were those who had been in Judaism, uh, like Crispus, uh, for instance, that who'd been the chief ruler of the synagogue, who had all that Old Testament uh, scripture memorized and, and knew it well. And when he got converted, uh, of course, the Holy Spirit had something to work with, all that amount of biblical knowledge that he would have had from the Old Testament. Uh, so possibly you might have that. But generally speaking, we're dealing with the vast majority of people who have been saved a short time, completely out of paganism, and they are all first generation. So we're not excusing them by any means, and Paul is not going to do that. But at least we're trying to understand oh, there are so many things going on in Corinth. And I think when we know all those things, at least it helps us to get a better grasp of what is taking place in this particular meeting. So it begins in this with this wonderful word, Paul, wonderful to them because he was the person that had brought the gospel to them. And he had come, as we learned last time, in weakness, fear, trembling, all these things, but he had preached the message and they had responded to that message. And he was their spiritual father. And, and so, of course, that was very precious to them. And so just to even get this letter addressed from Paul would have significance. And yet, because he's dealing with correction, he does assert his apostolic authority. And so it says, Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And so he was the one who had established the church in this pagan city, now, as we said, known for its commerce and culture and corruption. And yet he, he feels, even though he is their spiritual father, he still needs to remind them of the authority in which he is writing. He is writing as an apostle, one who speaks with authority, one who had been sent from God. And of course, these apostles were, were given to lay the foundation 
of the New Testament church. Ephesians 2 verse 20, uh, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And of course, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We understand that. But, but these were foundational individuals. And so we, we said that he's not a self-appointed apostle. He's a called apostle. Uh, he was called by Jesus Christ to this ministry. He saw the risen Christ who indeed gave him this commission to sent one to the Gentiles, sent with a mission, sent to declare the glorious gospel to the Gentile world. He had, he had seen Christ risen, and he had received that apostleship directly from him, and he was to be the apostle to this non-Jewish world. And again, God's ways are not our ways. I mean, if we're really honest, if we had been had anything to do with it and we saw this man paul converted who was a hebrew of the hebrews you know a, a pharisee uh, i mean one who was had been educated under gamaliel and with all his background who, who would we have sent him to well i'm certain that we would have said this guy is tailor-made to take the gospel to the jews i mean he's got all the credentials I mean, he speaks their language. He understands them. It's a, it's a no-brainer. He's the man. Let's send him. But, but isn't it interesting how God doesn't work the way we work? And he sends this man to the pagan world who knew very little about Judaism. And, and of course, uh, God just ha has his way of putting his hands on individuals and sending them to places that we would never imagine. And I think I may have mentioned last week, I forget, I've spoken so many times recently where I said what, but I think I may have said about Deal Moody being picked to go to speak in Cambridge and the power of the gospel. And again, we would never have picked Deal Moody and sent him to Cambridge. He's the last one we'd have dreamed of sending there. And so that's the way God is. He's amazing in his workings. It uh, doesn't work according to our conventions and our ideas. And so he calls this man to be his witness, his representative, uh, his one sent with a commission. And notice it as an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. This is interesting. It was God's will that the Gentiles might have an opportunity to hear this message through this man. Uh, God's will was behind it. He was, he, he's not willing that any should perish. And his will was that the Gentiles might hear this glorious message from the mouth of this man who had been set apart for this purpose. And it's interesting how when we think of Paul, we, we recognize that so much of what he brought was that which had been given to him directly from the risen glorious head of the church. And I want us to just be reminded of this. Uh, look, for instance, at the book of Galatians, and he will tell us that his gospel, where did he get that gospel from? Galatians 1 and verse 11 and 12. And he says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So his gospel came to him directly from the risen, glorious head of the church. His teaching on the Lord's Supper, as we look at 1 Corinthians 11, we notice that he certainly wasn't present uh, when that supper was instituted uh, in Luke's gospel, and chapter 22, he was not present. And if he had been there, he'd have tried to shut the thing down and arrest Christ there on the spot, most likely. But he tells us, and of course, what I understand, this is probably the first scripture that contains teaching on the Lord's Supper that is being circulated in the early church. And it's not given by those who were there as eyewitnesses. And so he says in verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And so isn't that wonderful to think that when we break bread every Lord's day, 
it was such a special thing that the Lord wanted to happen that when he revealed these lofty truths to the Apostle Paul, one of the things that he told him was that when you plant these churches, you tell them that they're to remember me in the way that I have appointed. And so very, very special to think of this. And of course, Paul's writings in general, chapter 14, because of uh, the liberalism that affects our day so much, and especially when it comes to women's roles and all these things, you know, we're living in a very kind of secular society and a very opposed to biblical Christianity. And when it comes to some of the things like the uh, veiling of women, like the silence of women, the people will just say, oh, that's Paul. And they'll just dismiss it with a, just a, a sweeping, that's Paul. There was Paul, the male chauvinist, da, 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 you've heard the story. But what he wants us to know in chapter 14, verse 37, and this is, this is the true test of spirituality. You know, he says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, now just step back and think about this for a minute. How many do you think in Corinth would have said, oh, that's me? See, I think they all had a problem with thinking that they were prophets or spiritual, even though he told them they were carnal, but they, but boy, they had a high opinion of themselves. And so he says, if anyone think himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, and of course, they all, oh, yeah, that's us, that's us, Paul, you're talking to us. He says, okay, here's the true test of spirituality. Let him acknowledge this, that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. They're not the opinions of Paul. They're the commandments of the Lord. And of course, we're saying, we're stressing with all conviction that Paul's writings were received from the risen, glorious head of the church, or his teachings. He got them from the risen, glorious head. And so, and of course, we're told, John 14, 15, if, Lord Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So here we have quite a combination. It's Paul's, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God in Sosthenes, our brother. So this is an interesting combination because you have Paul who was once a persecutor of the church when he was Saul, 1 Timothy. Uh, he's always reminding us of what he once was and always amazed that God would ever want him on his team. And so he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And then he talks about the gospel that had gloriously saved him. So who was before a persecutor and a blasphemer. And then, of course, we have this man, Sosthenes. And if our contention was correct last week, if we go back to Acts chapter 18, we'll remember that he also had his fair share of persecuting the church. And so if we break in in verse 12 of chapter 18 of Acts, it says, and when Gallio was deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, or ye Jews reason, would I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will no more judge such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of these things. And so obviously the instigator of this attempt at persecution and attempt to shut down the work was Sosthenes, the next chief ruler of the synagogue after Crispus. And yet I do believe that this man also received grace and forgiveness and perhaps heard the gospel, not just when Paul was there, but also maybe Crispus, his former colleague, went to him and shared and reasoned with him from the scriptures. But either way, this man not only was saved, but Paul had taken him with him into Ephesus. And so it says, called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. And then it's written, 
and addressed to the church of God, which is at Corinth. I just love this idea that in this wicked city, there is this church of God or ecclesia of God. And again, I think, you know, we don't want to uh, just be too hard on these things, but I do think church is a poor word in the sense that it conjures up wrong ideas in our minds. We know what it means. It's this idea of ec ecclesia and a compound word ek to call, uh, 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 sorry, ek is out and and or exit as in exodus clesis is to call so it's a called out company and it's just interesting isn't it in the first two verses there's a lot of calling here there's a called an apostle paul called an apostle there's the church this called out company out of the wicked city of corinth god had called out a people to his own name's sake and so this ecclesia they're, they're called out company and it says which at corinth that are sanctified in christ jesus called saints uh, we knew what they were like last week we said they were religious sinners and rotten sinners but now they have a new name a new designation they're saints they're called saints and then it says not just to them but with all in every place who call upon the name of the lord jesus so a tremendous emphasis on call here and isn't it wonderful that god is calling out of this wicked world servants like paul to bring the gospel to others he's calling out of this wicked world sinners and saving them by his grace and calling them to a new standard a new life calling them to be saints uh, to, to 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 be set apart for the lord jesus and then it's written to all that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So a great emphasis here on calling. But this, as we said, the church is not a, a building. It's this, this called out company, called out from the mass of humanity, called out from this wicked city of Corinth. And they're called out for his name, the name of the Lord Jesus, called out to gather to his name, called the church of God which is interesting, uh, this, this idea of church of God. Not, notice it says, the, unto the ecclesia of God, which is at Corinth. So it's not that Corinth was part of something, you know, as if it was, you know, kind of uh, a microcosm of something bigger. No, no, no. This is, this is church of God at Corinth. It's the called out company of God in Corinth. It's, it's an entity in and of itself. This is a called out assembly to the Lord in this wicked city of Corinth. And so what a wonderful thing it was where the temple of Aphrodite was, where there was all that perversion that we heard about. They, they were once entrenched in this stuff. And now they belong to God, called out by the gospel to him and belonging to him. He has the, is the origin of it, if you like. The church of God speaks of its origin. The whole idea of the church, it originates in God's initiation, in God's mind. It's the church of Christ because that's ownership. He paid for it uh, with his own blood. It's the church of the saints because that speaks of the composition. They're, they're saints, they're holy ones, they're set apart ones to the Lord. And then it's the churches of Galatia. It's the churches of a certain region. And here, the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. The day that we were saved, we were set apart for the Lord Jesus. We're set apart for him. We're, we're now to live for him who loved us and gave himself for us and died for us. We're set apart for him. And how we need to leave, lead lives that are sanctified, that are set apart for him. And so he says, uh, we're called saints, which is Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints. Now, this idea of called saints, it's in, in the King James here, it's called to be saints, to be is in italics. Uh, it's not in the original. It simply is called saints. And that's what we are. We're set apart. Every believer, whether they're one day old, or they're 40 years down the road, doesn't matter. They're set apart 
exclusively for Jesus Christ. They belong to him. He's purchased them. They're his. And they're saints. They're set apart ones. Now, it's interesting that every Christian is a saint. Of course, this was absolutely liberating to me uh, many years ago when I was saved out of Catholicism, because all the saints that we knew uh, were people who were supposedly specially holy people who had done several miracles and they were all dead. But here he's writing to people at Corinth who, as we proceed through the epistle, we'll see weren't exactly living what we would call saintly lives, but they were still saints. They were set apart for God, and it was every one of them, every true believer in Corinth was a saint, uh, without exception. And so every believer is a saint, uh, not some pious person recognized by some ecclesiastical court. They were far from that, but they were called saints. And it's good to realize that we are set apart ones. We're saints, and it's wonderful to be in the church of the saints and to or the churches of the saints and to enjoy the fellowship of the saints. And of course, this is our position. We're saints by calling, but God wants our condition and position to be the same. He, he wants us to, to, to be set apart in our lives, how we live our lives on a daily, daily basis. And so he's going to beseech us and challenge us to live like that throughout this epistle. He's going to say, you're a saint, live up to what you are. And of course, it says that they were sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. How did they become saints? Well, it's simple. There was a point in time where they saw themselves as helpless hell-deserving sinners, and in their desperation, they saw Christ crucified as their sin-bearer, as their savior, as their only hope, and they called upon his name, in every, the, the call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And, and of course, we read in scripture over and over again, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so the, there was a point in time, as we heard last time, these Corinthian believers, they called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. But this letter is not just for the Corinthians, but it's for all that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. In every place, it's for them as well. And so he wants us to understand that this letter, although it's certainly written to the church of God at Corinth, it, it certainly has relevance to problems that were going on in that assembly. But the application of these principles is good in every place, in St. Catharines, Ontario, uh, in Springfield, Missouri, uh, wherever uh, saints call upon the name of the Lord Jesus at our midweek prayer meeting. What are we doing? Calling on the name of the Lord, right? We're calling on him. And so wherever that takes place, these principles are applicable in every place. Notice too, it says that, that call to be saints with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ. And then it says this, our Lord, both theirs, he's their Lord, and ours, he's our Lord. And he emphasizes the Lordship of Christ. Now, what's interesting is that this is the first of 60 times in the Corinthian epistle that he will use the term Lord. Why is that so important? Why is that so significant? Well, a lot of the Corinthian issues would be solved instantly if they would live out the practical lordship of Christ. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Right? So, so if, if they really live that out, the reality of that, a lot of their issues would be dealt with. And that would be true of gatherings of saints, wherever they call on the name of the Lord Jesus. If our assemblies, practically speaking, every believer lived out daily the Lordship of Christ, there would be different, different places.
And part of our difficulty is we, we don't want to submit to his lordship. In fact, part of the problem is we want to be boss. And when that is the case, we have a lot of problems. Just like in the assembly of Corinth, lots of problems. And it's only when we get hold of the amazing truth of the lordship of Christ in our lives that there'll be true harmony and blessing in the meetings of God's people. So there's a great need for this. Notice verse 3, he says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, these very typical greetings, uh, the normal greeting uh, in the Greek world was charis or grace, uh, and so it's speaking of the Gentile world, and of course, peace, the Hebrew word shalom, uh, referring to both Jewish and Gentile origin of the assembly, but much more than that, that order is always retained in scripture. It's always grace preceding peace. And it's interesting that some has, one person has said this, and I thought it was very interesting, that grace was brought in. It was something that was brought to us. And so we read, for instance, in Titus 2 uh, uh, and verse 11, let me just read it to make sure I quote it correctly, because it's always good to to quote the scriptures accurately. But in Titus 2.11, he talks about, uh, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us denying ungodliness and so forth. So grace grace has been brought to us. It's been brought to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it came with him. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Not that grace was unknown in the Old Testament, but in all of its beauty and fullness, it came in the person of the Lord Jesus. And so he brought grace with him, but he left behind him peace to those that had received his grace. And so again, John's gospel, chapter 14 and verse 27, he says he brought in grace and he left behind him peace for those that received his grace. Peace I live with, leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he brought grace in, and he left peace behind in its wake. And oh, how thankful we are for the day that we came to know his grace. Grace is a charming sound, melodious to the ear. And oh, how wonderful it was that we understood grace, that salvation was by grace, that it wasn't by our effort and our works and all the rest of it, but it was by grace alone, by faith alone in the person of the Lord Jesus. And the peace, the peace that that brought into our troubled souls, we still rejoice into this very hour. And so grace always precedes peace. And of course, the source of it from God, our father, again, one who initiated the plan and the Lord Jesus Christ who carried out the plan. And again, it's just one of these many allusions to the equality and deity of the Lord Jesus, that grace and peace come only from God. Christ, that in the words, he's able to produce that in us like God the Father, and so their equality. And of course, man will never know peace while they reject the Prince of Peace. And of course, our world, there's lots of talk, lots of hopes for peace. But while ever this world refuses the Prince of Peace, there will continue to be turmoil and trouble and difficulty in hearts and lives. And so in verse 4, he says, I thank my God, always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. And so Paul, again, he, he's thankful and he's going to emphasize three areas. We're all we're almost need to land the plane here, but he's going to deal with the past, the fact that grace came to them through the Lord Jesus, and he'll ever be thankful for that. And then in the present, he's thankful for the gifts that they have. They come behind in no gifts because that's an evidence of salvation, that they've, they've received these endowments that come uh, from, from uh, the Holy Spirit as evidence of people being true believers. And so in the past, he's thankful for the grace that they received, uh, the, the gifts that they have, and then the guarantees that one day uh, he's going to confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so he's very thankful for all the benefits that were received by the believers at Corinth. And again, it's good to remind ourselves that although saints may not be living 
the way they ought to be. And maybe there's a need for corrective teaching in many of our assemblies, but we still can thank the Lord that God's grace came to them and that they do have certain gifts that have been given to them by the Spirit, and they also have certain guarantees that he that began a good work in them will complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. So may God encourage you to consider this, these early chapters in this lovely epistle, and may we again just recognize what a wonderful thing it is to be called out of this wicked world to the Lord, to be the ecclesia, the called out company, called to him, to worship him, to adore him, to love him, and to ultimately live with him for all eternity, eternal life beginning now. Uh, eternal life is knowing him and knowing his son, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing we have. Let's just give thanks. Father, we're thankful for the word of God. Uh, Lord, we, we pray again that even though perhaps many listening know all about 1 Corinthians, and yet, Lord, we pray that somehow these thoughts will come with freshness, with power, and will thrill us afresh uh, with the wonders. Lord, help us. We, we believe that one of the, the tragedies would be if we ever lost the wonder of it all, that you could visit a city like Corinth, and out of that wicked place could call out people who you now call saints, set apart ones. Well, what a wonderful thing it is. Help us, Lord, to just relish in the, the truths, maybe old truths for some of us now, but Lord, again, help us, Lord, deliver us from any spiritual staleness, and we'll give thee the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.